uh, really a calm and welcoming personality that's very helpful. Hello, everybody. I'd like to acknowledge, first of all, that I'm on the traditional and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, the traditional territory of the Stanaimo and Stanawas First Nation. So I live here in Nanaimo. So I'm today I'm so pleased to share my love of rhododendrons with you. In this seminar, if the photographer has not been identified, then the photos like the one on this first slide of a Campylogynum hybrid are my own and for the most part have been taken in my own garden. I need to tell you that this seminar is the property of the Vancouver Island Regional Library and Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association. It's intended for educational purposes only. My hope is that you will learn more about the genus rhododendron and come to understand why they're such a popular plant. The seminar is intended for those folks who are fortunate enough to live in the Pacific Northwest where the climate for growing rhododendrons is ideal. You'll learn about the diversity of this genus, something that you might never discover at your local big box store. You'll also learn more about what you need to do to grow this group of plants successfully. And finally, I've included the most frequently asked questions and the answers to those questions. So I think most of you are aware, but there are two handouts that go along with the seminar. The first gives you more information, including where you can go to see plants that are labeled so you know what they are. In the second handout, you have a list of the plants in the order that they appear in the seminar. Feel free to mark those that you might want to put in your own garden or put on your wish list. So what's all the fuss about rhododendrons? Well, look at this beauty. Yes, it's one plant. Rhododendrons are beautiful plants. This is rhododendron Cynthia. It's growing in the town of Ladysmith, which is just south of Nanaimo on Vancouver Island. It's been described as one of the top 10 trees of the world, truly. If you Google top 10 trees of the world, this plant is included in the list. This particular plant is indeed famous. When I was the president of the Nanaimo Roto Society, I had a phone call from a reporter calling from England to ask me about it. That seemed a little ironic as this hybrid was originally created in England way back in 1856. <laughs> This particular plant is reported to be over 120 years old, but more about this particular plant later. The genus Rhododendron is in the Ericaceae family of plants, in with the heaths and heathers, cranberries and blueberries. I've titled this presentation, Beauty, Diversity and Culture, because most folks are immediately attracted to the usually evergreen form and the beautiful blossoms of this plant. But more than beauty, this genus has an incredible diversity. There are over a thousand distinct species, one of the largest in the plant world. And from those species, growers all over the world have created more than 15,000 hybrids and still counting. This photo was taken last April in my own garden. And there are four different rhododendrons seen here. Three are species. From the left going clockwise are Strigillosum, Nivium, Macrophyllum, and in the foreground, a hybrid dwarf plant, Rhododendron Lusander. So you can see that two of those plants are not yet, one has finished blooming, the one on the left, Strigillosum, and the one on the right, which is our native Macrophyllum, has, hasn't started blooming yet. Basically, this genus has been loosely divided into six groups. Horticulturists have grouped them into nine subgenera and then into many sections and subsections, but I'll keep it simpler here. We have lepidotes, elepidotes, deciduous azaleas, evergreen azaleas, bereas, and then the misfits. Traditionally, botanists have used the study of plant parts and structures to identify plants. This is called morphology. Today, although some botanists can use the common ancestry of a plant's DNA to classify and identify plants, they still commonly refer to what can be seen with the naked eye or a hand lens in order to identify plants. This is important because as I've said, in the wild, over a thousand distinct species have been discovered and still they're still looking for more and they're adding to it every year. 
But most of the plants people grow are hybrids rather than the natural species. Species plants have often interesting, very specific characteristics that are noticeable even out of flower. This is significant because for most of the year, rhododendrons aren't in bloom. So look at this, looking at this picture, this is a rhododendron. It's a shrub, has fairly thick evergreen leaves. This plant is about six years old. I'm using it here to illustrate the point that you need to know something about these plants before you buy them. This looks at first glance as a fairly typical hybrid that you might find in a nursery. It's a hybrid by the name of Lem's Monarch. The name kind of gives you a clue that it's not your typical rhododendron. How big will it get? What color will its flowers be? When will it bloom? Where should I plant it in my garden? This is the same plant seven years later. It's now around 10 feet tall. So it's important for you to know something about the plants you're buying because you might have planned to put this plant in the bare spot in front of your living room window. So now I'll show you examples of the six categories of rhododendrons that I just referred to. You'll be able to see that there are differences. We'll start with the first category, lepidotes. So lepidote rhododendrons are those with scales, typically the smaller leaved rhododendrons. The word is derived from the Greek word lepido, meaning scaly. This photo is a close-up of a species plant named Baileyi. The scales on the leaves are small, so it's hard to see them in this picture, but you can see the scales on the backs of the flowers here, and on the pedestals, which are the flower stalks. And looking at them with a hand lens is interesting and kind of fun. Scales are structures that aid in reducing water loss and other protective functions. Rhododendron Baileyi is found in Tibet, Sikkim, and Bhutan. Notice that as I present species plants, I'll tell you where they are found in the wild, some of the time at least. So here's a photo of the same plant, Baileyi, with Unanensi in the background. Both are lepidote rhododendrons. Unanensi is on the left. Generally speaking, lepidotes do usually have smaller leaves, sometimes with less substance or thickness than a lepidote rep rhododendrons. But I do want you to know that not all lepidote rhododendrons are small in stature. Unanensi can grow up to 10 feet tall in six years. It's found in the wild in China and in upper Myanmar. And here's a close-up of the beautiful flowers. This is a picture of hirsutum. You can see the scales on the leaves. Hirsutum is found in the Central European Alps, the Austrian Alps, and Northwest Yugoslavia. This close-up shot of dwarf species Campylogynum that I showed you at the very beginning of the, the, the uh, seminar has leaves no bigger than an inch long and quite clearly has scales on its leaves. The leaves also have a beautiful distinctive scent, somewhat reminiscent of conifers. Campylogynum is found in Western and Northwestern Yunnan, Upper Myanmar and Southeast Tibet at a height of 3,650 to 4,000 meters. So these are plants that are very high up in the mountains. This dwarf spreading hybrid is one of the bird series bred by the Cox family in Scotland. They have hybridized and cultivated many bird named cultivars such as wren, ptarmigan, waxbill, razorbill, etc. These are perfect plants for smaller gardens and they can typically take more sun than the larger leaved plants. Rhododendron augustinii is the closest to blue of the lepidote species, and it's a stunning plant in flower. Like Unanensi, it has a taller growth habit. This is a sweet little truss of the species Primula florum docrela. It's a selected form of this dwarf plant, that means that seed, that seed was collected in the wild and from those plants that were grown on, this one in particular was outstanding. Primula florum can be found in Eastern Siberia, Southeast and Eastern Tibet, Sichuan and Gansu in China, and as well in Yunnan at an altitude of 3000 to 5000 meters. This shows the plant 
it is, which produces lots of flowers, even in an, the north facing shady spot in my garden, it also has exfoliating or peeling bark. You can tell that I have a particular fondness for this category of rhododendrons. I like the small guys. So the next category is the lepidotes, E lepidotes. E meaning without. So there, this group doesn't have scales on its leaves or its flowers or its stems. They're typically the larger leaf rhododendrons and the ones that you often find in, in uh, stores. They're loosely referred to by gardeners as the typical rhododendron. They often have larger leaves, as I said, and anywhere from several inches up to three feet in length. This beautiful rhododendron species is Lacteum and it's found in its native habitat in Yunnan, China and upper Myanmar. These types of plants make a statement in the garden and are often used as foundation plantings. Since they're usually long lived plants, it makes sense for gardeners to place them carefully. This alepidote species is our gyrophyllum Chinese silver. This plant is distinctive leaves covered in a waxy or shiny cuticle, and the underside is a beautiful silver coating, hence its name. Not all non-scaly rhododendrons have dull leaves, but this one is just exquisite. Our gyrophyllum is found in Guangzhou province in China. <clears throat> Degronianum subspecies Yakushimanum is a truly outstanding Elepido rhododendron found on the island of Yakushimanum in Japan. This photograph was likely taken in the UBC Botanical Garden in Vancouver. The uh, photographer is Douglas Justice, one of the uh, fellows who is heads the Botanical Garden there. You may have heard people talking about yaks and yak hybrids. This plant's valued for its compact and bushy habit consistent flowering and attractive leaves with a fuzzy coating of hairs on the underside called indumentum. It has been used countless times as a parent in hybridizing to create plants that are compact and always with beautiful flowers that, that are produced at a young age. Another example of a lepido rhododendron is rhododendron thompsoni, another interesting lepidote species found in Nepal, Sikkim, Bhutan, Assam, and Southern Tibet. It can grow to a height of 20 feet and has nectar pouches inside the flowers and a bright calyx, which persists with the after the flower drops. So a calyx is this, as, as you can see with my pointer there, um, this is a calyx. And uh, when the flowers are finished, the flowers just drop off, but the calyx are, are left and they're quite yellow and, and they're quite outstanding. It's quite interesting. It's a stunning plant with beautiful foliage as well as flowers, as you can see. It bloomed for me for the first time last year, but doesn't have a single flower this year. It's taken a rest because I moved it, I think. So hopefully it'll be happy in its new spot and next year it'll bloom. So the next category we'll look at are the deciduous azaleas. Deciduous azaleas are plants that typically put out new leaves each spring and drop them in the fall. Deciduous azaleas are often fragrant, as is this rhododendron luteum. Luteum is native to northern Turkey, southwest Russia, Georgia, and the Ukraine. All azaleas are in the genus rhododendron. So all azaleas are actually rhododendrons. They fall into the three of nine subgenera of this genus. Another distinguishing characteristic is that azaleas typically have five stamens and rhododendrons have 10 or more. Azaleas have one stamen per flower lobe and rhododendrons two or more per flower lobe. As with most plants, there are exceptions to the rule, of course. Azaleas are a good plant to purchase if you have lots of sun. They generally flower best in a sunny spot and can take the summer heat. This is rhododendron calendulaceum, one of the 15 deciduous azalea species native to the east coast of North America. They're able to survive the summer heat there and the humidity as well as the winter cold. Rhododendron mall, a Japanese species, can be, can be many different colors, orange, like you see here, 
yellow, salmon red, or brick red with a large orange blotch. Rhododendron occidentale, the only species azalea native to the west coast of North America, is shown here. The photograph was taken in the wild in Northern California. Rhododendron occidentale has been used extensively by hybridizers and is one of the many very fragrant rhododendrons. Some deciduous azaleas not only have beautiful flowers, but some have exquisite leaves as well. In early summer, like this quinquifolium here, and the same plant, not the same exact plant, obviously, but in, in the fall. The species is also found in Japan. I can't wait to visit Japan someday. So that takes us to the next category, evergreen azaleas. Evergreen azaleas are those that put out spring leaves and summer leaves. Neither set lasts a full season. This is Rhododendron cayucianum, and it's na native to Japan. This particular form, as you see, it's, it's fairly white in, inside the, the flower, and then with the darker uh, petals, edges. But it also comes in white and mauve, so, but it's still the same uh, species. You can quite clearly see here that the flowers have five stamens. James Gable is a hybrid azalea, and as you can see, it's quite happy in a pot. I added this photo so it's not on your list of plants. I added it late, so I wanted you to see an example of one in a pot. This is a plant that I purchased at one of our Nanaimo chapter plant sales, and one that I've never seen in a commercial nursery. Rhododendron camphorae is evergreen and sometimes semi-evergreen. They're often so covered in flowers that you can barely see the leaves. Some of the Japanese species have been used many, many times in hybridization. The indoor azaleas that you purchase in a florist shop are hybrid forms of rhododendron simsii, and they're not hardy outdoors in our climate. You can put them outside during the summer, but you have to bring them in over the winter. This little species dwarf, Nakahare, is also from Japan. It's less than a foot high and it's one of my favorites because of its ground hugging habit and late blooming time. So the next category are Varreas, a very complex and little known group of rhododendrons. Varreas are lepido rhododendrons, that means they do have scales, found in tropical areas like this Bayerintianum from New Guinea. They are tender in our climate. They must be kept in a greenhouse or indoors in our winters. This photo was taken at the Rhododendron Species Botanical Garden in Federal Way, Washington, in their amazing Rutherford Conservatory, where they have other tropical rhododendron species, tree ferns, orchids, and other exotic, beautiful plants. Once uh, COVID is over and the pandemic opens our borders, I, I highly recommend you going to have a look at the botanical garden there, it's outstanding. So here's a little Aime. This petite flound is found in the, is found in the mountains of Indonesia. The subgenus Varea is the most numerous of rhododendron genus, but they are not many in cultivation. Another beautiful, very different plant from Papua New Guinea. So now we're on to the last category of rhododendrons, the misfits. This is one of our native plants, which used to be called Ledum. It has been reclassified into the genus Rhododendron as it doesn't quite fit into the, any of the other categories. The same goes for the sweet little Kamchaticum variety glandulosum, which is found in the wilds of the Aleutian Islands in Russia. You can see how dwarf it is, very, very, has to survive in these incredible conditions. This photo was taken in my own garden, a far cry from the wild sea of the Aleutians, but it is Rhododendron chaticum, just the same. It's adapted well to cultivation and spreads by underground suckers. Now that you've seen some of the variety and differences in these plants and where they grow in the wild, I want to shift gears and give you some background about why there's so many different ones. As you've heard, rhododendrons are found all over the world. They are native to most temperate regions of Asia, North America, and Europe, as well as tropical regions of Southeast Asia and Northern Australia, and even in some extreme Northern climates. Notice the X's 
I'm just going to reduce that. Yeah. Notice these X's uh, around. This is not a very clear map, but you can see that there's some X's and dots, and all those are where rhododendrons are found. So they're, they're sort of widely scattered around the northern hemisphere there. The, but the largest number of distinct rhododendrons species in the world are actually concentrated in a relatively small area of Southeast Asia known as the Simo Himalaya. And the area stretching between mainland Asia and Australia. So there's one little grouping there on the edge of Northern Australia there. So note this map is taken from the American Rhododendron Society Journal, uh, volume 47, number three, and I think that was uh, uh, in 1993 that it was, that article was, came out. So how did this genus spread so widely? Do you remember from school the idea of continental drift, the formation of our present day continents from a single continent called Pangaea due to forces such as plate tectonics. Pangaea, which is up here on the upper left, was a supercontinent that existed during the late Paleozoic and early Mesozoic eras. Pangaea is the most recent supercontinent to have existed and the first to be re reconstructed by geologists. The fossil record gives evidence that rhododendrons have been on this earth for at least 50 million years. They were in existence during a time when immense changes to the ge geography and climate took place during the late Cretaceous period when the northern and land masses were still joined. So you can see in this bottom right uh, picture that uh, this is the way that it was formed in the Cretaceous period. So in 1991, at the American Rhododendron Society Spring Convention in Victoria, BC, two scientists from Victoria, Ted Irving, who was a geophysicist, and Richard Hebda, botanist, head botanist actually for British Columbia at the time, made a presentation which put forth some interesting ideas. They suggested that following a period of mild climate when rhododendrons were widely or more or less continuously distributed across now North America and Eurasia, um, their range became much reduced as a result of global climatic deterioration. So bear with me here, we're just about done. <laughs> in addition, as the two con continental plates collided over millions of years, the valleys and peaks caused many microhabitats to form in the, er in the area of Sino Himalaya. In addition, as the two continental plates collided over millions of years, the valleys and peaks caused many microhabitats to form causing relatively rapid development into distinct different species. Now let's have a closer look at the area on the current map to show what I mean. So here in the close up, you can see India, China, Bay of Bengal, Myanmar, and the Himalayas here. My copy is not entirely accurate, but the concept will help us understand what likely happened to dramatically increase the number of species rhododendrons. They talk about the formation of the Himalayan mountains through continental drift, so pushing up the Him Himalayas from both sides as, as the continents crash together. These forces created an area between India and China where there's an area of extreme relief. Relief is a topographic term meaning difference between highest and lowest level. Notice also the black line that I've outlined here, um, which is labeled section. Irving and Hebda argued that the present concentration of species in Southeastern Asia has arisen because it is there that habitats were developed in which rhododendrons found not only shelter from climatic changes, but in which they could flourish and develop into their own unique species. So notice the rivers, the huge rivers here that drain this area. So the Ganges, the Irrawaddy, the Salween, the Mekong, the Red, and the Yangtze. So these are huge rivers, but this is a very relatively, this is uh, only 400 kilometers at, at the cross section, this particular line. So here's the cross section showing the extreme changes in elevation between these rivers. 
in a distance of 200 kilometers between the Salween and one arm of the Yangtze, there are at least four mountain ranges that change in elevation from, from over 1,000 meters to over 3,000 meters and more. Nowhere else on Earth are there so many very deep valleys clustered so closely together. Some of these those river valleys drop by 2,000 meters. You can just imagine the change in climate as the elevation climbs or drops. In fact, some of the river valleys are tropical in nature at the bottom, thus supporting plants that thrive in a tropical environment, while the high elevations support alpine plants surviving high mountain wind, ice, and snow. The theory is that it has taken many millions of years for these changes to happen, and that's why there's so many different distinct species growing in this area. So let's get back to some plants. I'll show you some of the specific differences in plant parts and structures. And we'll start by looking at the rhododendron leaves. Scientists classify plants by looking at plant structures, as I said. In this seminar, we'll only look at two structures, leaves and flowers. Since flowers last for only a few weeks, it makes good sense to look at plant leaves first. In this genus, the variety of leaf size, shape, texture, and coverings is incredibly varied. An important aspect of rhododendrons is that there are wonderful landscape plants during the seasons they don't bloom, adding different leaf colors, textures, and interest in the garden all year long. This genus has some species with incredibly large leaves, such as this plant, Sina Grande. It has the largest leaves of all of this rhodos, up to three feet in length. These plants can be successfully grown outdoors here in the Pacific West Coast, but usually only in sheltered areas. It's native to Yunnan, Tibet, Myanmar, and Assam from two to 4,000 meters. Both the leaves and flowers of this species, Rhododendron hodgsoni, are large. The leaves are approximately a foot or more long. And as you can see, the plant itself is tree-like. Notice also the underside of the leaves, the dark chocolate brown color, which is called indumentum. Again, this dwarf beauty, this little campylogynum that I keep going back to, has some of the smallest leaves in the genus. They're less than a centimeter long. Each of the flowers has a long stalk or pedicel holding it high above its leaves to attract pollinators. This plant creates a small mound and grows to a foot tall in 10 years. As I said before, this species also has a very fragrant foliage. And you can think that and realize that this particular plant grew somewhere way high in the Himalayas. As I've talked about leaf size, now talking about shape. Rhododendron opicular leaves are almost round and the Latin name reflects the term opicular, which means round. And Roxianum leaves are long and slender. In the garden, these rhodos create very different textures. This plant also has wonderful indumentum, and more about that later. The long, slim leaves of Strigillosum adds texture to the garden, even in the fall, as it mimics the fading leaves of the ostrich ferns. And then some rhododendrons flower before the leaves appear in the spring, such as this deciduous azalea species found in Japan. Or sometimes the leaves appear at the same time as the flowers, like this Korean native, Schlippenbachii. Remember the chocolate brown leaf undersize of Hodgsonii and Roxianum? Another interesting characteristic of some rhododendrons is that they have hairs on the underside of their leaves and sometimes on their stems and, and their, their leaf buds, and in many different colors. We believe these hairs and other structures like bristles and uh, serve the purpose of protecting the plant from insects, helping to conserve water and protect the plant from cold and heat. This is Rhododendron barovii, which has this beautiful woolly rust colored indumentum covering both the leaves and the stems. The quality is that quality is one of the most sought after in the rhododendron world. In fact, several years ago at the American Rhodo Society convention in Sydney, one of the speakers from Germany said that this is the new trend in rhododendrons. Barovia is native to Yunnan and southwest Sichuan from three to 4,000 meters. That's 10,000 to 14,000 feet. And looking at Intimentum and wondering why it's sought after, this is the rhododendron Pachysanthum. 
And with Pakasanthan, you can see why it's so well loved. It not only has beautiful indumentum on the underside of its leaves, but also a bluish gray tomentum or hairs on the top of the leaves on its new growth. This covering gradually washes off with the rain. This plant is native to Taiwan and grows at an altitude of 3,000 to 3,200 meters. Here's another photo of the same plant. You can see why it doesn't even need to bloom. Its foliage is so spectacular. It's also one of the favorite plants in my garden when I have visitors. And it also has beautiful orange and momentum on the leaf underside later in the year after the leaves mature. And rhododendrons also have some have a waxy and shiny cuticle on their leaves at times. Some leaves, like on this hybrid Rubicon, have quite rough and deeply veined or rugose leaves. Or this little Lepidostylum, a beautiful small structured species with bluish green or glaucous leaves when the leaves are immature. It also has hairs along the margins or edges of the leaves and raindrops sit on top of the leaves, similar to plants like Alcamilla mollis or ladies mantle. And sometimes the new growth and leaves are pretty distinctive too. Often they are much paler in color, but as they mature, they change. Wiltoni is a fabulous foliage plant and is found in the wild in Sichuan at, and at a height of two to 3000 meters. The new growth can be a contrasting color as well. The bud scales are kind of interesting too. And there are these strap-like features that used to cover the, the, the leaf bud. And as the stem grows, they, uh, leave, they are farther down the stem and they make it look interesting as well. This selection was collected in the wild by one of our modern day plant hunters, Dr. Peter Wharton the former curator of the UBC Botanical Garden. Campanulatum originosum leaves are truly a metallic blue-green and are considered to be the Rolls-Royce of foliage. As I said before, this color in plant foliage is described as glaucous, a most desirable trait. So now that you've seen the variety in size, shape, and other traits of leaves, it's time to look at flowers. Flowers are obviously important plant structures that horticulturists use in the identification of plants. Flowers are often the focus of hybridizers as well. For home gardeners, rhododendron and azalea flowers are often what attracts people to them to start with. Flowers and are vary tremendously in color, shape, and size. The long pedicels or stalks of each individual flower in this hybrid create what is termed a lax truss. That means that the group of flowers at the end of the stems hang down. Hybrids are the offspring of two plants of the same or closely related species, differing in one or more genes. This has been done and continues to be done innumerable times to create a unique plant that has some of the characteristics of its parents. The plant in this picture is tortoiseshell orange, which is a complex hybrid created from four different plants. Goldsworth orange, orange times Grisonianum crossed with Dicroanthum subspecies Dicroanthum and Fortunae subspecies Discolor. So hybridizers really have to know their plants and what they're trying to achieve. Hybrids are often bred for the color or flower shape. In this case, the Azalea hybrid Cheerful Giant has a double flower. Horticulturists call this type of flower hose in hose. In contrast to the lax truss of tortoise shell orange, midnight rep demonstrates a term you often hear in the rhododendron world, that of a ball shaped flower truss. Most rhododendrons hold their flowers at the apex or end of their stem. When judged in shows, people enter a whole flower truss to be judged, including the first set of leaves immediately under the truss. Occasionally, flowers do appear both at the apex of the stem and at the leaf axils. Like the flower buds on this species, Rhododendron scabrifolium. The term scabrous refers to the rougher, gritty texture of to the hairs on the stem and leaves as seen in this close-up of the buds of scabrifolium here. This is a very interesting plant in my garden. It's, 
its uh, branches sometimes go sideways and tall. It's quite, quite a bushy shrub, but very interesting. And some plants, of course, are bred for their unusual color, such as the winner of the trophy for best in show and people's choice at the 2015 annual show and sale in Nanaimo. It's a very dark hybrid by Frank Fuchioka, a hybridizer who lives on Whidbey Island in Washington state. Notice how the stamens show up against the dark flowers. Sometimes plants are bred for the specific color feature, such as blotches or Piketty features like Elsie Watson. The term Piketty refers to a flower having one basic color with a margin or edge of a different color. Or speckles like Paprika Spiced, which also has a different color on the outside of the flower corolla than on the inside. So you can see that the outside here, the back of the, the, the leaf or the petal, sorry, is, is darker than the inside. Flower shapes can be unusual as well. The individual flowers of Spinuliferum are very unique and are described as being narrowly tubular. Notice the protruding stamens and stigma from the, with the flowers standing up. This plant is found in the wild in southern Yunnan, China. And I have this plant growing in a pot where you can appreciate its spreading and low growing habit, sprawling really, with, their fi <laughs> with its fibrous roots with its fibrous root systems, rhododendrons can grow well in pots if you water them deeply once a week in the summer. And another unusual flower shape is this cross of two species plants, Tinnaburinum and Kesei, called Sinkeys, a combination of both of the two parent names, which has a longer tubular funnel shaped lax truss. Some plants produce only a few flowers at the end of each stem. But Pemacoense almost completely covers itself with flowers every year. You can barely see its leaves, and it comes from eastern Tibet. Buttermint is a hybrid created by a prolific US hybridizer named Jim Barlap. He recently passed away and left his considerable collection to the Victoria Rhododendron Society. They are creating a public garden within the township of Esquimalt. It's the Jim Barlap Legacy Garden located in the Esquimalt Gorge Park. He was working on creating more varied color forms amongst other traits in hybrids. Other hybridizers created new plants to extend the bloom time. One of my grandmother's hybrids is Royston peach. It's a cross between a reculatum, a species that is very late blooming, and a hardy and floriferous orange hybrid named Rhododendron fabia. Although her first love was species rhododendrons, she bare, briefly worked on creating hybrids that would extend the rhododendron season. Some of these plants bloom from June into July or even August, which is another interesting trait of this genus. Some begin blooming in late winter, while others begin blooming in early summer. So with growing these plants, you can have flowers in your garden from January through July or August. And just to make things even a little more confusing, there are even a few azalea dendrons, crosses between some of the species subsections, and in this case, a member of the azalea subsection and the rhododendron subsection. Here's another azalea dendron, Hardizer's Beauty, another roto azalea cross, which is, has been quite available in garden centers. And I can't forget to mention that some flowers have an amazing fragrance. Rhododendron edgeworthii not only has a lovely flower, but also is a highly scented plant with attractive leaves and a nicely colored calyx. This species is a favorite of a lot of rhododendron growers, even though it's a bit tender and may need some winter protection. I was talking earlier to one of our master gardener members who has a hybrid of this species, and he puts it, he yeah, keeps it in a pot by his front door, and when it's blooming, has just the fragrance is incredible. So now that I've shown you just a taste of the variety found in this genus, I want you to have a quick look at the species that are found in our own province. Rhododendron albiflorum is found in Western North America from BC to Colorado at 12 to 2000 meters. So locally, you can see these plants easily at Paradise Meadows on Mount Washington. 
on here on Vancouver Island. This is one of the few plants like Rhododendron scabrifolium that have its flowers growing down the stem of the plant. Our local native rhododendron macrophyllum found on Vancouver Island north of Nanaimo inland from Nanus Bay in an area beside the aptly named Rhododendron Lake. It also grows wild on a hillside above Seashelt and along the Hope Princeton Highway in Manning Park and down into Washington State. This little native roto is found in our northern Rockies. This photo was taken at Summit Lake along the Alaska Highway here in BC. But the plant is circumpolar, growing in Arctic regions, including Lapland, northern Sweden, northern Norway, Greenland, Labrador, northeastern USA, and the Canadian Arctic. It is found from sea level up to 1800 meters. One tough little plant that might be challenging to keep alive here on the coast. And if any of you have hiked in the woods in northern BC, you'll be familiar with what used to be called leadum, or commonly buck brush, or Labrador tea. It's now recognized as a rhododendron species and has been named rhododendron grown landicum. And it's, as I said, it was one of the misfits. So now that I've shown you how varied this genus is, it's time to turn toward growing these plants. We're fortunate to live in an almost perfect climate for growing them. There are five very important considerations for growing rhododendrons and azaleas successfully. Where we live, we already have some of the conditions that rhodos need to thrive. Most soils in our area are fast draining, but not all, and the soils are, are acid. Four and a half to six on the pH scale are considered acid, which is the pH that rhododendrons need to grow well. Our climate is relatively mild, so we can grow a wide variety of plants. I'll illustrate the five points listed here with photos from the development of my own current garden, which I started in 2009. I'll start with looking at drainage. And in my case, drainage was a problem. I didn't have the sandy, fast draining soil that I had in my previous garden in Nanaimo. The soil on the new property was heavy clay, is heavy clay. This picture was taken in July, one of our driest months. Rhododendrons and azaleas thrive in moist, well-drained soils high in organic matter. They have shallow, fine, hair-like roots. These roots do not tolerate water-saturated soil conditions, but do require moist soils. Poor drainage and wet soils are problems often associated with heavy clay and compacted soil. One way you can test drainage is to dig a hole about 10 to 12 inches deep and fill it with water. Then after it drains, fill it with water again and see how long it takes to drain. If the hole drains within an hour, you have good drainage. If the water has not drained out of the hole within an hour, the soil is poorly drained and you must correct the damp, damp drainage problem before planting. Planting in raised beds is the best solution in heavy soils, so that's what I had to do. Because I had a problem with clay and drainage, my contractor set about creating a French drain around not only the perimeter of the house, but also the perimeter of the property. This was to ensure that the water flowing through my property from the rise to the east was able to drain away. You can see the clay and the compaction caused by the process of construction. Not a great combination for a future garden. There needs to be a lot of work done here for the garden. So moving on to the next important component of a good rhododendron garden, is the amount of light on the plants. Rhododendrons and azaleas all need some light to bloom. One of the conditions that you can control is the amount of light. So in my case, instead of growing trees to give shade, I needed to take down some trees to give plants the light they need to grow well. The ribbons on the trees here are those trees that I wanted to keep. This photograph was taken in January or something, that's when they were taking the trees down on the property. Here's the faller. The faller was not only cutting down some of the smaller trees, but also taking off the lower limbs of the larger trees on the perimeter to create more light. My property backs onto the Esquimalt and Nanaimo Railway, so that opening creates some light as well. Dappled shade is definitely best. This 
picture was taken not too long ago, a few years ago, but you can see that the cedars in the background were limbed up. Here you can see some of those branches were taken off, as well as the firs. Rhododendrons and azaleas do well with direct light for at least part of the day to bloom well. Generally, large leafed rhododendrons are less tolerant of sun and wind than small leaf rhododendrons. If you have a windy spot in your garden, you'd do well to have the smaller leaf varieties there. Think back about where many of our rhododendron hybrids have come from. Those with large leaves probably grew in those deep river valleys, sheltered from too much sun and wind, while the smaller leaf varieties could withstand more sun, wind, and colder temperatures. So the next important consideration for growing all plants, all plants actually, is the type of soil they're growing in. Rhododendrons are acid-loving plants. As such, they perform best when their soil is acidic. Fortunately for us, <clears throat> our local so soils are usually the perfect acidity. Even if you truck in soil like I did, it comes from local sources. I recently had my soil tested and it was rated as 5.1 on the pH scale. So the next stage in building my garden was bringing in the soil to create those raised beds. With so much clay in this native soil, I asked for a mix of compost with a fair amount of sand to give the plants appropriate drainage. In gardens with heavy clay soil, the best approach for growing rhododendrons and azaleas is using a raised bed atop the native soil. About half of the planting medium should be organic material. Combinations of sphagnum, peat moss, fir bark, compost, and aged chopped leaves should be worked into the soil to a depth of about 12 inches. Adding a large amount of organic matter will raise the bed, which will improve the drainage and aeration of the soil. Aeration is important for healthy growth of rhododendrons and azaleas. Beneficial microorganisms in soils require air for respiration and metabolism. Vital microbe and fungal activity, such as decomposition of organic matter that make nutrients available for plants, nitrification and beneficial mycorrhizal associations depend on the oxygen present in the soil. Notice that the Douglas firs have had their lower limbs removed as well in this picture above these, the trucks here. And I'm sure that you can see another prob problem that I had to deal with. I got the new soil, but the soil underneath it was compacted by all of the heavy traffic. This slide shows two of the many truckloads of soil I purchased. You can see that it's lighter and more porous or fluffier soil than what was on the property to start with. A year later, here are some of my raised beds. Raised beds were built on top of the native soil to a depth of about 12 to 18 inches and held in place with rock walls and with a few timbers. Raised beds do require watering during the summer as they dry out quickly. And that brings me to my next point in rhododendron culture, water. This slide also shows the irrigation systems that I had installed. And you can barely, I'm just gonna try and get a pointer going here. You can see the risers here along the edge of the beds. All plants need water to grow well, especially until they're established, at least for the first year, year and a half. I was careful as I could, you might not be able to tell with this photo, but I was careful to plant the shorter rotos in the front and the taller growing rotos in the back. These are long lived plants and well worth doing some research to help you decide how tall they grow, how wide they grow. And all of these beds were created by trucking in the soil, as I say, and placing it atop the heavy clay layer. In mild climates like ours, rhododendrons and azaleas can be planted almost any time of the year. Here are two planting diagrams taken from the American Rhodo Society's website, showing two different methods for two different soil types. In diagram one, this is for most gardens in the Nanaimo or Mid-Island area at least, um, it illustrates planting with well-drained soil. Rhododendrons need well-draining soil with an abundance of organic matter, as I've said, Rhododendron and azalea roots need oxygen for healthy growth. 
Many materials can be used to amend the soil. Compost or decomposed pine bark are really effective. So you can see that where there, here's the existing root ball, a, a fairly shallow planting hole was dug and this was well draining soil. So the water will be able to penetrate through and not sit in this little bowl. And then also mulch so the water runs. So you have, make a sort of a little uh, cup shaped area around the stem uh, with mulch, but keeping the mulch well away at least three or four inches away from the stem. In diagram two, this is a different type of planting if you have clay on your property. Heavy clay soils collect and retain the water, so it's recommended to plant rhododendrons and azaleas above the base clay soil in, in a mound of desirable soil. So here's the, the soil, uh, native soil, and you bring in the um, new soil and put it right on top of the ground. If you dig a hole in heavy soil and fill it back with light soil, you may be creating a bucket which will hold significant water. So this shows also the roots growing into this lighter soil uh, in one growing season. Poor aeration results in the development of toxins in the soil. Plants in heavy soils with poor aeration often become chlorotic from malnutrition. To improve soil aeration, the best amendment is organic matter, with compost being an excellent choice. Mulching with coarse materials such as arborist wood chips or coarse bark mulch also aids in allowing air to get into the roots and eventually adds to the organic matter to keep the soil healthy. It also helps reduce water loss and prevents weeds. I mulch every two to three years, being careful to keep the mulch away from the stems by at least three or four inches. So I don't fertilize my established plants much at all. Here is a summary of important cultural considerations for rhododendrons that drainage is critical, some shade is best, you need loamy acid open soils, you need to water, you need to have some irrigation in our dry summers, mulch is helpful, and you need a shallow planting. And better than fertilization is having, because I don't fertilize much, because if a plant doesn't look happy and thriving, then I try to figure out what the problem is. And I believe that having proper drainage, good open soil, planted appropriately in some shade with enough water, rhododendrons will thrive. Some growers swear by a balanced fertilizer just after blooming. Others say you should fertilize before plants start their new growth in the spring and again after blooming. From the topic of rhododendron care, I'll now address some of the common questions that plant nuts like me are asked about rhododendrons. So to start off common questions, people ask, where do I go to get interesting plants? I've purchased most of my interesting plants, especially species varieties at local rhododendron club annual sales in the spring. Each club has, has their own sale, usually on different days. You can go to their sales, which are often held in conjunction with their plant show for early, late April through the middle of May. I highly recommend joining your local rhododendron chapters. They have monthly presentations on all types of plants, not just rhododendrons. The cost to join is minimal, around $30 to $40 a year. Many of the local rhododendron growers are no longer propagating plants and the local chapters are taking cuttings and propagating their own plants to take to their sales. So you'll definitely be finding some interesting plants there. Members are friendly and willing to share their knowledge and experience. And here are the, there are five local chapters on Vancouver Island and uh, only two chapters on the lower mainland. But you can also certainly buy rhododendrons at our local nurseries, we have some very good ones. So what do I look for when I buy plants and when should I buy them? April and May are the best blooming months for rhododendrons and azaleas. This is a good time to visit places that sell plants or show plants and you can see them in bloom with their labels. That's why on the handout, I suggested three or four uh, uh, gardens that you could go to see where the plants are actually labeled so that you could see what they're like um, in a garden. 
in my uh, so <clears throat> in retail outlets, look for good plant labels. They should have a specific name. You'd be surprised that some labels just say rhododendron. And if it doesn't, doesn't, then you can look up that plant. And if it does have a name, then you can look up the plant on your phone or iPad to find out more about it. If there's no or little information, ask for it. Even if there is a decent plant label, it might not really tell you much. You need to know how big a plant gets, for example. And this label for the hybrid Noyo Chief says growth is moderate. Well, what does that mean? When you attend a rhododendron club sale, you can ask members and growers for more information and they'll tell you how big they get and when it blooms and any other question you may have about it. Also, if you attend clinics with master gardeners, you'll also be able to access this type of information. Most of the local clubs have very good websites that offer a great deal of information too. So what happened to my roto? What's eating my roto? This damage is an extreme example of, of black vine weevil damage, and it's caused by root weevils, we, root weevils. And the adult form of the weevil crawls up the stems and onto the leaves and starts chewing away on the leaves. Their feeding habit has a typical ragged look to the edge of the plant leaves. Root weevils are native here in BC and they thrive in our woods. The adults climb up the plants, as I said, and you can always go out at night because that's when they feed and pick them off the leaves with a flashlight. <laughs> Keeping plants healthy and happy is always the first line of defense. And if they're stressed, they're liable more to be eaten by things. So stressed plants, as I say, suffer damage more often than, than happy plants and seem to attract pests of all kinds. Proper watering, a mulch to retain moisture, fertilizing appropriately and good housekeeping will help keep your plants healthy and unattractive to pests. Pruning off the lower leaves that touch the ground, structures or other plants will reduce access to the plant for the, for the weevil. You can go out at night with a flashlight and pick off the leaves as I've said. <laughs> and there are plant cultivars, cultivars that are vine weevil resistant, such as Sir Charles Lemon. If all else fails, purchasing fairly inexpensive nematodes from your or ex expensive nematodes from your local nursery and watering them in when the soil is warm can also make a difference. Here's damage from a caterpillar during early leaf growth. When the leaves were just in bud, the caterpillar ate part of the bud, and when the leaves grew, you can now see where it ate the leaf. The damage is round and uniform. This slide illustrates leaf senescence. So someone says, what's wrong with my roto? The leaves are yellowing and dropping off. Well, it's a natural process of leaf drop. Typically, evergreen rotos have one or two or even three flushes of leaves per year. So at the end of one year or every second or third year, they just drop their old leaves. What's wrong with my leaves here? This plant is Saracenum cherry brandy in my garden. On the photo on the left, some of the leaves have brown patches on them. The side on the left is facing southeast. And in the early spring when its leaves are tender, the hot spring sun burned its leaves. This is called sun scald. You can see the other side of the plant on the left here, which faces northwest in the picture on the right, and then the leaves are healthy and not burned. Most often problems with plant leaves are reflecting environmental damage of some type, like the sun scald, over fertilization or drowned roots, that kind of thing. What's wrong with these leaves? This is called chlorosis. This is an example of, of leaf chlorosis. The veins are green, but the rest of the leaf is yellow. This is perhaps one of the most challenging issues of, to diagnose, as it could be a large number of issues and perhaps an element deficiency like iron or nitrogen. Or it could also be too much of one element like phosphorus. How off, however, as I said about uh, aeration in prior slides, it can also be poor drainage, which may inhibit the plant from uploading the proper nutrients, nutrients it needs. And it may actually have the right nutrients in the soil, but it's just too waterlogged to bring them up. Other possible deficiencies are magnesium. So, in my opinion, the best thing to do is prevention in the first place. 
Ensure proper drainage, porous, healthy soil, and a good mulching every few years. You may need a soil test to be sure what the problem is if the cultural requirements are all good. Why is my rhododendron blooming in the late fall or winter? Here, this is a Greg hybrid land living, and it's trying to bloom in, on December the 17th of this past, past year. Sometimes plants get fooled into thinking that spring is on its way. There was a cold spell, and then all of a sudden the weather warmed up, and the, this plant thought it was spring and it better start blooming. Ooh, yikes. And here it is again a few months later. Oh no, is this plant dead? No, it's just responding to severe colds. Minus eight degrees Celsius on February the 12th at my place. Some of the flowers are brown and you can see here and they are, they've been killed. They are gonna be mush. I just pick those off and some of the remaining flowers in the truss will develop nicely. Many rhododendrons respond to cold by collapsing their leaves to protect the leaves, to protect themselves, and that's a natural process. And behold, here's the same plant on March the 4th, some three, three weeks later, looking pretty fine with almost no damage except to the few blossoms that I pruned off. Can I move my rhodos and when? Absolutely you can. As I've said, rhododendrons are shallow rooted and fibrous rooted. They don't have a long tap root, so they're generally fairly easy to dig up and move. Using a shovel, cut around the drip line of the plant and gently lift the plant out of the ground onto the tarp or board. Or if you're really smart and have a lot of plants that you move around, you can put the plant onto a balanced heavy wheeled cart and move it that way. The best time to move plants in our climate, I think, is the fall. They'll have time to regrow some roots and settle in before the next strong growing season. That being said, with appropriate watering and care, they can be moved almost any time, even when they're flowering. This photograph also shows some good bark mulch. The pile of mulch on the left is semi-composted bark mulch. And if plants are happy, blooming well, and not stressed, I don't fertilize much with chemical fertilizers where these plants are evergreen and they slowly grow all year, even over the winter. So they nibble rather than they need big meals. How can I tell which is a flower bud and which is a leaf bud? In the middle photo, in the, you can easily see the difference between a leaf bud and a flower bud. The flower buds are, are usually larger and fuller, quite a bit fatter. They're quite distinct from the smaller, less obvious flower buds. Or less obvious, leaf buds. Sometimes the flower buds are ornamental in their own right, having different colors, shapes, sizes, and coverings. The most frequent question about rhododendrons is about deadheading. Do I need to do it? That brings up the topic of pruning. Deadheading is removing the spent flowers after blooming and is the lightest form of pruning. Look at the two photos in this slide. The picture was taken outside of a local pharmacy in February. The plant on the left wasn't deadheaded and the one on the right, which is uh, the same cultivator, cultivar was deadheaded. You decide which is more attractive. That's usually why deadheading is done, especially on larger flower plants. It just looks tidier. Deadheading is considered as light pruning, but it doesn't really change the structure of the plant very much. It might slow down the production of new flower or leaf buds, and that may slow the growth of the plant, which is sometimes you don't want it to grow too much. Deadheading also prevents the production of seeds, so the plant can put its energy into producing next year's flower or leaf buds instead of producing seeds. And deadheading is usually done after the plant flowers. Some plants are naturally leggy. If you want the plant to grow bushier, you can use a process called tip pruning. You just take your fingers and nip off the carefully the, um, the top bud seen here. Being careful not to knock off the small leaf buds and leaf nodes beneath it. The eyes here, these little things 
are growth buds that will develop into new branches. So instead of one straight branch going up, they will go sideways and reduce the height of the plant. As with other shrubs, if you're uncertain and your plant is really leggy and floppy, you can cut back a third of the plant in selected areas, trying to keep the plant looking balanced. Most rotas respond to pruning well. Or if you're certain that the plant is a strong growing one and you can see growth buds down the stem, you can also hard prune. Like this example of hard rejuvenation pruning, which can be done if the plant is blocking a pathway because it wasn't put in the proper place to start with. I took this photo in an old garden in Cornwall a few years ago. You can see that the plant is regenerating, is even going to produce flowers. It looks like it was hard pruned around three or four years before I took this photograph. So to wrap up this seminar, remember the Lady Smith wrote it under Cynthia from the beginning of the seminar? In a huge rain, snow and windstorm in December of 2018, the gigantic canopy of this plant acted like a sail and three weakened trunks fell over and broke from the main plant. What a mess and what a disaster for such a famous plant. It appears that there may have been some root rot in the roots and that's where it broke off in the storm. So the owner of the property called around to some of the local rhododendron chapters and we came to have a look to see what could be salvaged, if anything. The owner hired an arborist to come and salvage the plant. He took down some of the height, carefully opened up the plant so the wind would be able to blow through the tree canopy. He did this carefully, taking his time to look at the tree to ensure it looked good as well. This plant is living on the brow of a hill overlooking the town and is not only in direct sun all day, but also gets the full brunt of southeasterly storms. It's reported that there is an underground spring under the plant, which keeps it well watered. And that's why it's grown so large. And talk about a survivor. This photo, one and a half years later, show it, it throwing shoots from one of its sturdy trunks. This is a close up, but that's still pretty amazing. The parents of this incredible hybrid are two species plants, one Catabiance from North Carolina and Griffiania. Both species are large plants when mature, and Catabiance is very hardy, not only cold hardy to minus 25 degrees, but also heat tolerant. It's one tough plant. And here it is on the second spring after its heavy pruning, with two of the five trunks remaining, healthy and the plant once again thriving. So thank you all for your attention. That comes to the end of the seminar. I do hope that you've learned both how interesting and worthwhile these plants are to grow in your gardens. I do grow lots of other plants, including a veggie and berry, berry garden, but the ornamental garden gives me a lot of pleasure and helps keep me healthy both physically and mentally, especially during these pandemic times. I will now do my best to answer your questions and do use the links provided on the handouts to get more information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. That was very, very interesting. Would you like me to read you the questions or would That's you like to- That's probably a good thing. Okay, sure. We just have three or four. Uh, the first one from Wanda. How do you keep cedar roots from taking over where you plant your rhododendrons? I am having a problem with cedar roots taking over 20 to 30 feet from the actual tree. That's uh, a very good question. And I wondered about that myself. And you can see in this particular last slide, that there's a large cedar right behind this particular bed. What I did is, I have, of course, I, <clears throat> I had limbed up the, the cedar, first of all. <clears throat> and then with bringing the um, soil into my property and planting on top of the cedar roots that were already there, uh, it seems to inhibit, uh, the, the, at least the rhododendron um, roots seem to inhibit the uh, uh, the cedars from mingling too much and going a different direction. So it doesn't seem to have been a problem for rhododendrons. I can't speak for a, a lot of the other plants because I haven't planted anything else under those cedars. Uh, actually, skimmia to one side, but bringing in and putting the, the, the topsoil on first before planting is a good idea, is what I did. So perhaps that will help. Great, thank you. 
All right, the next question. Um, would you please ask Chris to talk about rhodopollen um, and do bees transfer it from plant to plant? Good question. Yes, I think they do. And that's how in the wild things got a little muddled and, and, and hybridizing between different species. So I certainly, um, uh, I know I've noticed, yeah, you know, birds uh, going after the pollen, and also bees as well. So definitely, you know, the bees like their pollen. I'm not sure if I've really answered your question. That's great. Okay, and from Michelle, can you offer your ideas on adding mycorrhizae at planting time? Um, um, I don't. Uh, I actually, I've just take, finished taking a, a, a course with uh, the Victoria Master Gardeners uh, on soils, and that question was asked of some of the specialists there, and he said that the, the mycorrhizae are already in the soil, and it's not necessary to, to actually buy more, uh, normally speaking, and if you have uh, really good, um, decent soil, you're, comp you're, you're adding compost and other organic matter to the soil, uh, it shouldn't be necessary. But I know that they are apparently selling mycorrhizae. It's, so it's up to, up to you if you think that you haven't got enough organic matter perhaps in the soil, but the mycorrhizae will definitely need organic matter to, to grow healthy and survive and, and multiply. Great, interesting. Um, what are your thoughts on top dressing with Epsom salts? Um, well, it depends. Um, I've tried it several times with no success. So I think it depends uh, as long as you have um, uh, diagnosed the problem correctly. And if you know that that's the, the kind of, uh, I can't remember whether Epsom salts is, um, is uh, I, I'm not sure which which of the elements it is. Again, I just can't think. I guess I'm I'm tired. <laughs> I can't think of what which one it was. But if you look up Epsom salts, it'll tell you what element it provides. Whether that's uh, I think magnesium. it has magnesium. I, I think it's magnesium actually. Magnesium. Yes, yeah. I do too. Yes, yeah. I'm quite sure. Uh, that's why we put it in our bath, right? Uh, the magnesium for our sore muscles. I think. Right, uh, right. So uh, if it is a magnesium deficiency, and you'll see right away if you use Epsom salts, and if you within a month you should see a difference if it is a magnesium deficiency. Oh, great, great advice. All right, a couple of questions in a row about the best time of the year to prune. Ah, the best, well, certainly you don't want to prune when uh, the flowers are producing or are in bloom, but uh, like most plants, you can certainly prune, you know, after flowering is probably the best time because then there's time for uh, things to regenerate and more stems to grow during the summer. But you can prune at any time. And like most pruning, first of all, you want to prune out the dead wood, et cetera, et cetera. So that can certainly be done uh, at any time of year. With okay. deciduous plants, because it's harder, it's easier to see the structure of the plant, you might want to you know, prune those in, in the, the, the early spring. Great. Well, that's pretty easy. Um, what about using Lysol solution sprayed on the ground to deal with weevils? Does that sound good? I, I know I, some people swear by it, but if you spray Lysol on the soil, you're also going to kill all the microbes and the mycorrhizae, et cetera. So I would be careful with that. You know, if, if you have a concern about say root weevils or something like that in, in a pot, you could try that, um, but Personally, yeah. I wouldn't use it. <laughs> okay, great, great. Um, oh, good. I'm, I'm happy to see this question. I'm wondering myself. I'm excited to see that you can plant rotos and azaleas in pots. That's yes. so nice to hear. So somebody asks uh, the best varieties for oh, pots. Oh, my. The best, best varieties for pots or... Yes. Would it just generally be the smaller varieties, maybe? Or? I would. I would say certainly. Uh, I can remember at Aerosmith Nurseries up in uh, Parksville or up by um, 
on the way to Port Alberni there, they used to have a fairly large species in a very, very large pot. And I asked them how they, um, you know, how long it had been in a pot. And it had been in a pot for like 10 years or something. And it was, you know, the pot was large, maybe like a 24 inch or three, th sorry, a you know, three foot wide pot with about a three foot depth. But so it was big and heavy, but the plant was maybe four or five feet tall and wider. Uh, they kept it quite pruned, but they said that they actually, um, it was quite happy and it was a beautiful plant. Uh, so it, it has to certainly have enough room in the pot to stay healthy. And you would certainly have to feed it with probably some chemical fertilizers or good compost to, to keep it happy and healthy. And obviously water it more frequently than you would with a plant in a garden. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We're probably not going to get to all of your questions. We keep getting many, many questions popping up, but we'll just uh, do as many as we can before 2.30. Uh, the next one is Sealy Ponce. I have an R Sealy Ponce, yellowing. Uh, it's a variety called C-I-L-I-P-E-N-S-E. Oh, Silipanense. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it is exposed to the afternoon west sun. The leaves are light green to yellow. Do you think that's too much sun? I think it's too much sun for it, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, I get something like lice on some leaves in the hot, dry summer months. I've just been washing them off or cutting the branches. Is this a good idea? Let's say that again. I'm, I wasn't... It's like a in the hot, dry summer months. There's like a like a lice on so some of the leaves. So there's an insect on the leaves. I guess so. That looks like a lice. Oh, something like lice. Oh, it could be white fly, but they're tiny, tiny little flies that would yes, that probably with water would be just sprayed off. I'm, I haven't ever seen uh, scale insects on rhododendrons, but they certainly are on things like dogwoods and, you know, that kind of thing. So, and what you, you can just pick them off, but, or use a strong a water solution. Um, I'm not really sure that's, it would be helpful to have uh, photographs of things like that to see what they actually are because you don't want to harm the beneficial insects too. So it would be helpful. I know it's the, um, and I say this on the, on my handout, the um, garden advice line at Miller Gardens in Woodland. If you send a picture or the question to the master gardeners there, they will um, uh, give you the, might be able to help you a bit better if you could get a picture of it. Yeah. Okay. Great Hard advice. So, yeah. Yeah. And another question about weevils. Uh, hmm. um, some rotos being attacked by weevils. Is it worth it maybe just to get rid of the plant and get a new one? Um, depends. If it's if there's just a few leaves that are chewed, I just ignore it because weevils are in our um, in our native soils, right? So. Um, if it's if it's a if it's a bad infestation like the picture the photograph that I that I showed you, um, that's a whole different ball game, uh, because you can pick them off at night or you can, um, as I said, you can you can purchase um, nematodes from any of the garden centers. Uh, you get them in a little package. There's millions of them in the little package that you can hardly even see, but you put it in, 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 a, in, in water in, into a, you know, a garden container with water and spray the ground around the plant. Uh, but you have to wait till the, the, the soil is warm to do that. But that actually works quite well. I tried that first. I don't think you need to get rid of the plant unless it's really, really bad. But then the the, uh, the weevils will still remain. So okay. yeah, I'd use, I'd use nematodes if it's a bad situation. Okay, great. Uh, another question. Uh, for the past two years, all of our deciduous azaleas have been denuded. One year I found tiny black bugs, the next green caterpillars. How to prevent this? 
what the best thing to do is to note when they get defoliated <laughs> when they get because yes i have one or two cultivars of azaleas that the caterpillars and you know i just don't have the uh in my brain at the moment the name of the caterpillar but the uh yes they love those azaleas and they will defoliate the plant so note when it happens look at the plant and get rid of the eggs which will be on the underside of the leaves because it's the caterpillar form of a moth that is eating those leaves but i just pick them all off i just kind of watch pick them all off try to wash them off with 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 water to begin with and then uh and that seems to do the trick but i you have to you have to be able to do that before you see it um before you see them all defoliated obviously so just keep a good eye on the plant and you know pick them off or wash them off with with strong with water um and pick off the ones that you don't get but you have to do that every other day or so so i hope that's answered the question and i wish i could remember the name of the, right. the wretched beast but yeah, somebody suggests Somebody suggests azalea sawfly. Larvae. Yes, that's exactly it. It's oh, azalea great! Azalea sawfly. So okay, look, excellent. Look that up, and and uh, yeah, it'll tell you what to do. Okay, excellent. Oh, good. We're coming right to the end. This is perfect timing. Just one last question. It looks like. Good. Uh, just your best recommendation for um, that will tolerate the west sun, a shorter variety. Depends what color you like and the hot sun, I, I, you know, azaleas certainly like the hot sun, but of course, unless they're evergreen. Um, okay, she says she likes a pale color. Ah, a pale color. They're, mm. they're, um, you know, they're 15,000 hybrids. So. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah. Um, go to your local store have a look at what's blooming now you know and uh usually the the, the plants that have the the smaller leaves certainly are more sun tolerant for sure i'm just trying that, to think which ones are uh in a lot of sun in my own garden not as many so some of the certainly some of the hybrids are much more sun tolerant than the species so Okay. And they usually have fancier names for sure. Okay. Interesting. That's super helpful. Yeah. Smaller leaves, hybrids. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much, Chris. That was an excellent, super interesting talk. Thank you everyone for coming. Our next uh, virtual gardening seminar is June the 5th. The topic is roses. That will be presented by Wendy Strachan and Carol Ward. We hope to see you for that one. Uh, and please fill out the survey that I've put into the chat there. Uh, we can, in this way, we know what you want and we can bring you workshops like this, which are super popular. So Chris Southwick, thank you so much for an excellent presentation. You're welcome. And thanks for your help, Kendra. It's very, okay. very, I see very I have a, a red spot on my screen there that I didn't realize I had, but Oh, Not okay. Sure. Had to get notice. rid of that, but oh well. <laughs> All right. Enjoy your day. Thanks, Thanks again. so much. Bye for now. Bye. Oh, just to let you know, it's Wendy Strawn. <gasps> Sorry. I That's okay. That. You wouldn't know that. <laughs> okay. That's we'll how know you it. pronounce your last we'll name. We'll know it for the presentation. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye, Bye, Chris. Bye, everyone.